Mr. Pennyrake smiled. He was awfully fond of Christmas. No other time of year offered so many, as he liked to put it, opportunities. He admired his new coat in the glass. It was a great improvement on the last one, which that girl, Suki, had carelessly burnt with the iron. She had rather carried on when he had sacked her, sobbing incessantly about her sick widowed mother with an excess of little ones still at home. But he had to make an example of her, or the rest of the servants would think they could be equally careless, and she was much less willing than she had been at the beginning of her employ. So an example was made. Mr. Pennyrake straightened his cravat. People said he was a handsome fellow, and who was he to argue? With a final approving look in the glass, he picked up his gloves and made his way towards the stairs, where he nearly collided with Jane. "'Beggin' pardon, sir,' she said, blushing prettily, and tried to step around him. Like the new coat, Jane was also a great improvement on her predecessor. She was far prettier than Suki, and Mr. Pennyrake had high hopes of her contributing to his domestic happiness. "'Not at all, my dear,' said Mr. Pennyrake, putting out an arm to detain her. "'You're in a great hurry.' "'It's only Master Henry, sir,' she said. "'He's wet his bed again, and I, I must get some clean sheets.' Here Mr. Pennyrake put an arm around Jane's waist and told her he was heartily sorry that Master Henry was causing her extra work, and that he would have a word with him this very minute. Jane took a step backwards, her modesty was really quite becoming, and replied that Master Henry was only little and she did not mind, but Mr. Pennyrake insisting on obliging her. Truth be told, he would rather stay and oblige himself with Jane, but Mrs. Pennyrake might be along at any moment, so he promised himself he would make another opportunity later and climb the stairs to the nursery. He arrived to find Nurse pulling a clean frock over the young offender's head, "'Papa! Papa!' he cried as soon as his head came back into view, and he held out his arms to be picked up. "'When is it Christmas?' Mr. Pennyrake rifted his son, holding him at arm's length for a moment to be sure there was no danger to his new coat. Finding the boy dry, he held him close and carried him over to the nursery fire as Clara dropped her doll and ran to join them. "'It's tomorrow, isn't it, Papa?' she squealed. "'I told him it was!' Mr. Pennyrake nodded and settled himself in the rocking chair with one child on each knee. "'It is tomorrow, Clara,' he said with a smile. "'And what happens on Christmas?' "'Presents!' shouted Henry. "'And sweets and oranges and turkey and cake and pudding!' Mr. Pennyrake said nothing, but looked at the children with eyebrows raised. Clara folded her hands on her lap. "'Baby Jesus is born,' she said. "'And?' said Mr. Pennyrake. He seemed to have something else in mind. Henley wrinkled his nose. We go to church? Mr. Pennyrake nodded. All of those things, but one more. He paused for dramatic effect. Krampus comes visiting. Little Henry was puzzled. Who is that? he asked. As ever, Clara was ready with an answer. Our uncle, you ninny, she said in a stage whisper. In this instance, however, she was mistaken. No, no, said Mr. Pennyrake with a smile. Krampus is not a man. Krampus is a beast. He is a beast with tangled black fur, horns like a goat, and a pointed tongue as long as my arm. He walks on two cloven feet. He carries a great basket on his back and a birch rod in his hand. Do you know what those are for? The children shook their heads, their eyes as large as dinner plates. The birch rod is for whipping naughty children. Here Henry gasped, children who wet their beds at night. I told him he mustn't, Clara interjected. It's the third night this week. Mr. Pennyrake continued, or children who tell tales on their brothers, or do not put away their toys. This information silenced Clara at last. The great basket is for carrying naughty children home with him what he does with them there, I cannot tell you. With that, he deposited both children on the floor. Once there, Clara ran to pick up her doll, and Henry stood contemplating the basket of wet sheets beside his bed, a woeful expression on his face. Mr. Pennyrake strode from the room, a smile on his lips. There was nothing like a little fear to guarantee the desired behavior.
A day full of opportunities awaited Mr. Pennyrate after he left his breakfast table. On the way to his offices, he stopped in at a coffee house on the next street but one. Mr. Redfern could be depended upon to be there at the time of the morning, and Mr. Pennyrake had made up his mind to accidentally meet him. Mr. Redfern's round face brightened on seeing Mr. Pennyrake, and he called out to him. "'What a surprise to see you!' said Mr. Pennyrake as they shook hands. "'Jack!' said Mr. Redford, as he gestured towards a chair beside him. "'You're the very person I've been hoping to see!' Mr. Pennyrake took the pre-offered seat. "'Oh?' he said. "'Then, but you are in the morning. What has happened, my dear fellow?' Mr. Redford glanced down in his black armband. "'Yes, well, it's Mrs. Elliot, my aunt.' "'I had no idea!' Mr. Pennyrake exclaimed. He had, in fact, heard it from a very reliable source the night before. "'My deepest condolences. "'I'll not disturb you further in this time of grief,' he prepared to stand, clearly alarmed. Mr. Redford reached out his hand. "'No, no! Jack, don't go! I was hoping you would advise me!' Mr. Pennyrake was well concerned. "'Now, Redford, you know I would do anything to help you, but I know nothing of arranging funerals.' Mr. Redford waved him away. "'No, no! Jack, it's about her estate!' Mr. Pennyrake again pretended surprise as Mr. Redford confessed that he had inherited all of his aunt's money and didn't know the first thing about what to do with it. He had no experience with solicitors and had no idea who to trust was such a sum. Mr. Pennyrake grasped Mr. Redford's arm. You may be easy on that account, Redford. I would be most happy to advise you. He then explained that he knew of a very promising fund in which he could invest the old lady's money and that he would be happy to make all the arrangements for his friend. Solicitors would charge a ridiculously amount in fees and not take any care of that money were disposed of responsibly. Mr. Pennyrake, however, would handle it all for nothing, save, of course, some very small expenses he might incur in course of the business. If I am not mistaken, he said upon parting. This may very well be the making of your fortune, Mr. Redfern. As he took his leave, Mr. Pennyrake accepted Mr. Redfern's repeated protestations of gratitude and promises that he would allow Mr. Pennyrake to handle it all. Any charges incurred, Mr. Redfern told him, would be well worth the peace of mind gained by his friend acting on his behalf. Once Mr. Pennyrake arrived at his offices, he made himself as comfortable as any spider in his web and prepared to receive any opportunities that presented themselves. He was not disappointed. First was Mr. Youngson, the grandson and heir of Lord Barrington. It is Christmas indeed, thought Mr. Pennyrake as he stood to welcome his guest, a wide smile on his face. His smile quickly turned to a look of concerned sympathy as a young man related his reason for troubling Mr. Pennyrake. I'm afraid I find myself in a bit of a... Here, Mr. Youngson ran a hand through his hair. Well, an awkward situation. A bit of a fix, really. Mr. Pennyrake appeared most dismayed to hear it, and offered Mr. Youngson some brandy, which that gentleman readily accepted. You see, he continued, fortified by the drink, I sometimes amuse myself with a small bet on a game of cards with friends. Mr. Pennyrake nodded. A harmless indulgence, surely, he intoned wisely. Mr. Youngson pulled absently on his ear and made an attempt at a laugh. It was a feeble attempt, and an even feebler laugh. That is, uh, just what I thought, but now I find I have gone through my entire allowance, and I have another five months before I receive it again. Lord and Lady Barrington greatly disapprove of gambling, so I can't possibly tell them what's happened to the money or ask for any more. A gentleman of my acquaintance, here Mr. Youngson supplied the gentleman's name, suggested you might be able to assist me in the amount of— and here he specified a handsome sum. Mr. Pennyrake made a mental note that the gentleman's kind referral would not go on more unrewarded. Certainly— "'Certainly, Mr. Youngson. All you need is put your name to a promissory note to be due in. Shall we say three months?' Mr. Youngson looked as though he might like to protest, but was not sure how. 
Oh, I know you will not get your next installment for five months, but I, I do not think I can lend such a sum for so long a time. But perhaps this advance, said Mr. Pennyrake as he wrote out the promissory note, would allow you to return to your card-playing friends and make up what you have lost. Mr. Youngson mumbled something about thinking of reforming and not playing cards again. Nonsense, Mr. Youngson, Mr. Pennyrake said bracingly, putting the pen into young man's hand. Your luck will change, and you can give the business up then, if you like. Mr. Youngson brightened a bit. Yes, he said. Doubtless it will. He dipped the pen in the ink pot and hovered with his hand above the note. But what about the terms for the repayment? Mr. Pennyrake made a graceful gesture with his hand. Oh, they are the simplest in the world. Go ahead and sign the note, and I shall provide them to you as you go out. I'm sure you have much to do. You can easily peruse them on your way home. As Mr. Youngson signed his name, Mr. Pennyrake reached in a drawer and lifted out a heavy booklet which he pressed into the gentleman's hand, along with the bank note for the agreed sum. It's a bit dry reading, to tell the truth. I might not bother if I were you. You will be able to make full payment in three months' time, won't you? Mr. Youngson gave a slight movement of his head that might have been a no just as easily as a yes. Mr. Pennyrake smiled broadly and shook Mr. Youngson by the hand. Splendid, he said. Then I shouldn't worry with it. He clapped Mr. Youngson on the back as he escorted him to the office door. Unless, of course, you ever have trouble sleeping, and then no apothecary could provide you a better remedy. As it was Christmas Eve, Mr. Pennyrake was especially disposed to be pleased. Therefore, everything pleased him. He was pleased to collect payments on debts he owed, along with the generous interest he charged. He was pleased to extend loans and interest owed a little longer, knowing that his due would eventually be greater still. He was even pleased to threaten legal proceedings against some who could not pay. He was sorry for them, but of course, they had to come to him. After all, he could hardly be held responsible for the fix they had gotten themselves into. But nothing pleased Mr. Pennyrake so much as his last visit of the day. It was with a young woman who, with reddened cheeks, told him of her husband's ill-advised speculation in a railroad venture, the poor health which had kept him from working recently, and his ignorance of the seriousness of the situation, as the lady herself handled the family's accounts. Sitting in the chair he had offered her, she kept her eyes downcast. He is too proud to accept help from his family, and he would be so angry if I, if he were to find out I had come to you, but our rents are due, and we've no money to pay them, and it is Christmas. I have nothing to give the children. At last, she had the courage to raise her imploring eyes to Mr. Pennyrake's. Mr. Pennyrake had to admit he found the lady quite charming. He put on his most concerned expression. I am certain I can find a way to help you, miss, he trailed off, waiting for her to supply her name. The pink in her cheeks deepened. I'd rather not, she whispered, her eyes on the floor again. Mm. Of course, of course, he said sympathetically. I quite understand this is a matter of some delicacy. In that case, I will need some surety of your repayment. Mrs. I'd rather not seemed to have anticipated this, for, reaching into her pocketbook, she drew out a string of pearls. Mr. Pennyrake smiled. Mm, the very thing, he said, as he bent to make out the paperwork. Now I will need you to put your name and address to this little paper, but you have my word that I shall not look at it so long as you return with your prompt payment. She nodded. When the document was finished, she leaned her delicate head over it and studied it minutely. Upon presenting her pen and ink, Mr. Pennyrake discreetly turned his back as she signed it, then made a show of folding the paper and sealing it in a way that seemed most secure. Mrs. I'd rather not would have no way of knowing that Mr. Pennyrake was an expert at unsealing and resealing documents when necessary. At last, he slid the payment under his desk and said, It just remains for me to collect. She stood, the pearls held close to her. They, uh, they were a, a, a wedding gift for my husband, she whispered. Mr. Pennyrake nodded solemnly. They will be safe with me, madame. 
I assure you. She held the pearls out then. He could feel her reluctance through her glove. At last she dropped them onto his waiting hand, and she was gone. Quite, quite charming, Mr. Pennyrake thought to himself as he locked the pearls into his desk. He had a fleeting idea of taking them home to Mrs. Pennyrake, or, even better, to Jane, but he soon dismissed it. He needed those pearls. There was nothing like the need to keep a husband in the dark to turn a Mrs. I'd Rather Not into a Mrs. Well, maybe just this once. As he had decided to leave the pearls, he made a few stops in his walk home, purchasing the requisite brooch, dollhouse furniture, and toy soldiers, not forgetting something special for Jane. Servants deserve to be rewarded for their hard work, after all. Quite satisfied, he arrived home to find his house in the usual pre-holiday disarray. The children were shrieking in anticipation, and the kitchen was a bustle of activity. "'I'm afraid tea won't be ready for a little while yet,' said Mrs. Pennyrake, as she tucked a stray curl behind her ear and presented her cheek for a kiss. "'They're just finishing the mince pies.' "'No matter, my dear,' he told her, handing her his hat, but failing to notice the pre-offered cheek. Just have Jane bring me a brandy. His wife made it as if to follow him. I can bring, she began, but he interrupted her. There's no need to wait upon me, my dear. That's what servants are for, he said, leaving her alone with his hat in the bottom of the stair. In his library, all was quiet. Mr. Pennyrake moved his chair in front of the fire and closed his eyes. It had been a satisfactory day indeed, but it was not over yet. Jane was coming with his brandy, and Mrs. Pennyrake was occupied downstairs, supervising the mince pies and the tea. Who knew what might happen? He sighed, a contented sigh. Behind him, a rustling. Ah, Jane, he said with a smile, eyes still closed. Do come in. Close the door behind you. The door did not close. Mr. Pennyrake looked around. Jane? No one was there. He settled back into his chair. Floorboard creaked. Jane? There was no response. Perhaps, thought Mr. Pennyrake, one of the children was stealing in to search his pockets for presents. Henry, he said with a growl, go downstairs. There was another creak, and a curious odor stole into the room. It was as if the outdoors had gotten in, a scent of cold, moist air and freshly turned earth. Mr. Pennyrake found it somewhat distasteful. He did not altogether approve of nature. It was why he lived in town rather than the country. He rose to see if the window was properly fastened. It was. He then closed the door and returned to his chair. Eyes closed, he amused himself by imagining a scene in which Jane entered with his brandy and he presented her with the pair of gloves he had bought her. He was just arriving at the part in which she unwrapped the package and looked back at him eyes shining, when he heard another noise, a clicking on the floor behind his chair. It was like a footstep, and yet not. Henry would leave the room when he was told, but sometimes Clara showed a decidingly independent tendency to disobey. Do you remember who comes to visit naughty children, Clara? Clara would reply when called by name, however, and there was no reply. There was only silence. "'Who is there?' Mr. Pennyrake demanded, beginning to feel rather aggrieved. There was another sound then, a deep rumble, as if a bear had somehow learned to purr. Mr. Pennyrake would turn around, suddenly found he was not at all inclined to see who or what was behind him. He asked again, "'Who is there?' The rumbling repeated, and the fire seemed to tremble in the grate. There was a voice behind him. It said, it was an extraordinary voice, like thunder speaking. It sounded as though it came from a mouth unaccustomed to forming words of any sort, let alone English ones. <laughs> Mr. Pennyrake felt a sort of warmth, a presence behind him. The voice continued. <laughs> now Mr. Pennyrake, frozen in his seat, heard a scraping against the wood of his chair behind his shoulder. The voice was closer to him now, as was the scent of fur and burning leaves creeping round his chair like tendrils of bog. <laughs> Mr. Pennyrake vainly searched his thoughts for an appropriate response, 
Somehow, he doubted that telling this creature, whatever it was, that he did not believe in it, and had only told his children that story to frighten them into proper behavior would be well received. He fumbled for his handkerchief and wiped the sweat from his cheeks. Yes, of course, he said, with a bit of crack in his voice. I am most in debt to you, to be sure, but I flatter myself I have the matter well in hand. This time, Mr. Pennyrake could feel the vibrations of the wild rumble through his chair. The voice said, only the hint of a question in its inflection. Mr. Pennyrake was not at all desirous of giving offense to this being. I am loath to take up your valuable time in such a trivial matter as this, if you take my meaning. I am sure you will forgive. His words were extinguished as he felt his hair being disturbed by a snorting and snuffling all around his head, as if he were the Christmas turkey, being sniffed to see if he were cooked through. Said the voice. It is just what I say myself, said Mr. Pennyrake, and he attempted a chuckle, but it died upon his lips as he saw something he hadn't before. There was a basket, sitting directly next to the fire. He felt quite sure he didn't own a basket so large as that. But, uh, b perhaps I could, uh, simply tell the children you were here, and there would be no need for that, his arm feebly indicated to the basket. The voice was soft, and yet it filled the room. As his mouth was too dry to speak, Mr. Pennyrake took a moment to consider. He eyed the basket, wondering which of his children this creature intended to take. Clara was the most trying to his patience, as rule, but then again, as son and heir, Henry was so far proving a bit of disappointment. He supposed Mrs. Pennyrake would find it an inconvenience to replace either one of them. Behind him, he could hear the creature breathing. The breath sounded as if they came from very large lungs indeed. Perhaps it would be best to let the creature make up its own mind. In fact, the basket was sizable enough to hold both children quite easily. The breathing sound grew, drew closer, as did the animal smell. Mr. Pennyrake ran his tongue over his dry lips. I, uh, I'll just fetch them then. He ventured to stand, praying his legs would hold him as far as the door, but a weight on one shoulder pressed him slowly back into his chair, squeezing with an uncanny strength. The sound of the creature's breathing seeped into Mr. Pennyrake's ears and mouth and all the spaces between his clothes and skin. The rumble behind him drew so loud, Mr. Pennyrake thought, and, be it admitted, ardently hoped that the noise would rouse the house. <laughs> said the voice. The breath was hot on his cheek, smelling of wood smoke and pine forest. The fire guttered, as if a gal were blowing through the room. Mr. Pennyrake began to shrink down in his chair but he was caught by something sharp and claw-like biting into his shoulders. He sat, immobile, as something warm, wet, and rough dragged itself across his face from chin to eyebrow. The fire suddenly leapt high and roared in the grate, and for an instant the massive shape of something horned and hairy loomed before Mr. Pennyrake's vision. Then the fire died all at once, as if snuffed like a candle, and Mr. Pennyrake was swallowed by the dark. Now there was nothing but the voice spreading into his lungs, filling them up until he could barely breathe. It said, lower than a whisper. <laughs> Mrs. Pennyrake knelt down, Surveying her children and their Christmas finery, she straightened Clara's sash and smoothed the lock of Henry's hair from his forehead. Then she gave them each an approving kiss. Jane will fetch you when all our company has arrived, she told them. And remember, no asking for presents, but say thank you if you receive any. <laughs> 
At this point, the children resumed bounding about the nursery in their excitement as Mrs. Pennyrake descended the stairs, musing to herself. How very changed they both were. Henry had been dry so long, she had at last had a pair of short trousers made for him, and he was quite puffed up with the responsibility of being the man of the house. And Clara, too, was growing into a pleasant companion who occasionally let others get a word into the conversation. Mrs. Pennyrake felt a lightness of heart she could not in any way account for. Everyone had been so kind, that much was true. The servants had done everything they could to ease her mind. Jane, in particular, had been invaluable. Though she could not explain it, maids had never stayed long in her employ before, especially ones as pretty as Jane. But with Jane managing the house, Mrs. Pennyrake had met the challenges of her husband's mysterious disappearance the best she could. People calling to see her and attempting to pay back money they owed Mr. Pennyrake caused her the most distress. She refused to allow anyone to make her any repayment, for it seemed she had plenty of money, far more, in fact, than she had ever imagined. Truth be told, she began to think she had no idea what sort of occupation her husband had practiced at all. He had always told her he performed a valuable service, but Mrs. Pennyrake could not understand how it could be valuable when these poor individuals came wordly, even tearfully, to her door to ask, even beg, to be given more time to honor their agreements with her husband. She had met the most agreeable people in this manner, however. There was Mr. Youngson, for example, who played at cards, but never gambled. Then there was Miss Arbuthnot and her family, who would be arriving any moment now. Mrs. Pennyrake could not think of any reason for a gentleman like her husband to keep a lady's pearls in his desk drawer, and had given them back to Mrs. Arbuthnot straight away. She was quite happy to promise to say nothing to Mr. Arbuthnot about the matter, and the two ladies had become great friends. Although, and perhaps Mrs. Pennyrake only imagined it, she always felt Mrs. Arbuthnot looked relieved when her inquiries about whether Mr. Pennyrake had been heard of were answered in the negative. Of course, there was Mr. Redfern. Mr. Redfern had made himself indispensable in every way, helping her with the police inquiry or business matters, dropping round to keep her company, playing with the children, in short, doing any little thing for her happiness and comfort. But still, no one had heard from Mr. Pennyrake since a year ago this very night. No, she could not in any way account for her high spirits. Mrs. Pennyrake heard the knocker just as she was passing the front door, so she called to Jane that she would answer it herself. There on the doorstep, a happy flush on his round face, was Mr. Redfern. Mrs. Pennyrake begged he should come inside and asked if she could take his hat. He gladly held it out, but did not relinquish it, and their fingers touched over the brim. Neither let go. "'You are the first to arrive,' she told him. He always was. She took a breath and spoke again. "'Before the others arrive,' she said, examining his hat intently, "'I hope you will allow me to tell you how very grateful I have been for your friendship this past year since—' She trailed off. She began again. "'You know things have been difficult for us, Mr. Redfern, and I—' Mr. Redfern pulled his hat a little closer to him and bent his head to the level of hers, hoping for a glimpse of that charming dimple which appeared on her cheek when she smiled. Charlotte, he said earnestly, I do despair of you ever calling me Nicholas. At last she met his gaze, a blush suffusing her cheek. Nicholas, then, she whispered, as she hung his hat on a hook beside the door. Shall we go up? As the two proceeded up the stairs to the drawing room, Mrs. Pennyrake smiled, just enough to provoke the appearance of a celebrated dimple, and she allowed Mr. Redfern to draw her arm through his. She was awfully fond of Christmas.